Hey, everybody. Thanks again for listening to the Gain, Grow, Retain podcast. On this week's episode, we have Cindy Zhu, who is the chief marketing officer for a company called Logarithm. Uh, formerly, she was with Level Access out of uh, the D.C. area. But uh, really forward-thinking CMO who thinks a lot about customer experience and customer success uh, the way that we do. And so um, we're excited to share this conversation with you. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the podcast. Welcome to the Gain, Grow, Retain podcast. So we are here with Cindy Zhu, who is the uh, chief marketing officer at Level Access, at Level Access, uh, based out of the the DC area. And um, Cindy and I met, uh, oh man, almost a year ago now. Yeah, about a year. Um, just be- yeah, just before you joined Level Access, and so uh, you've always been somebody on the list that we wanted to just spend more time with and, and talk about a little bit more, and because you really understand customer success and how it. Uh, hangs together with marketing and product and all these and sales and all these other facets of the business. So um, thanks for taking the time to to chat with us today, uh, today, Cindy, and um, maybe, maybe just lead off, give it, give us a little bit of an overview of, of your, what you're doing at Level Access, what Level Access does, because it's really, really cool stuff. Oh, thank you so much, Jay and Jay and Jeff. It's such a pleasure to be here with you on your podcast. And yeah, let me first talk a little bit about my company, Level Access. It's such a great company and and such a cool mission. So basically, Level Access, what we do is we help make digital properties. So think your websites, your mobile applications, it could be electronic documents, and we make them accessible to people with disabilities. And of course, the growing aging population that may be using assistive technology as well. So if you think about the proliferation of digital devices, you think about how dependent we are on digital technology. I mean, I don't think I can live my life now, Jay and Jeff, without going on Google and doing searches and using my email, right? And everything is online now, shopping, everything. And so just imagine the level of difficulty, someone with disabilities uh, who may have vision impairment, that may have a physical dexterity challenge and how difficult it is for them to navigate this digital world, right? We're talking about shopping online, buying groceries, even applying for apartments, uh, mortgage applications, all kinds of stuff. So we're very, very proud of what we do. And we help our customers, which many of them are the most famous brands and companies in the world, make their digital assets and digital properties accessible. So it's very, very cool work. That's awesome. A very noble mission as well. So when you and I first met, we were starting to talk uh, a lot about this idea of a maturity model for your customers at Level Access. And uh, I know you've given that a lot of thought. So would you mind like just talking a little bit about the way you're looking at the maturity model of your customers? Because the way your customers come to Level Access is sort of really interesting. It's very reactive in nature, but I think over time you moved into sort of a a proactive kind of relationship with you. Um, Would you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, I I would love to because Jay, you're spot on. And Really, I um, this isn't this is such a love fest uh, podcast. I feel like we're starting off with, but you know, you you really did so much great work to help us in the you know before I joined too, and with the team, just kind of helping us collect our thoughts. And I remember when you and I were chatting about it, it, it's so true. You know, we have to think about how do we deliver the best experience to our end customer. And I know a lot of times everyone says that you know it's all about the customer, it's all about the customer. But if you really look at companies, many of them actually don't do those things. You know, it's still very much on their perspective on like, hey, we see it working this way. And it really is a a change in mindset. It really is helping to first document what is this journey that your customers go through, not from your perspective as the company and as the vendor and provider, but your customers. And so you're spot on, you know, level access traditionally, uh, many of our customers are in the situation where uh, maybe their website or their mobile app was found to be inaccessible. And so they end up getting into a lawsuit and it comes through as a demand letter, right? It's, uh, you know, a lot of times retailers, you you just don't know uh, that maybe all of your pictures were uploaded for your products and they don't have an alternative text and people with a screen reader can't read them, you know, uh, or if there's some other function that prevents you from shopping on a website. Well, and, and, you know, next thing you know, you get a demand letter from a law firm and it's like, hey, you know, your website's inaccessible and what have you. So a lot of our customers in that very beginning phase were because, oh, my gosh, I got a problem to solve. You know, I've got an immediate pain point. Uh, I got this demand letter. I need to take care of it. So we do get a portion of our business um, that is coming in that way. It's reactive. But eventually you have to kind of help educate the customer that accessibility is a journey. It isn't a one and done. It isn't like I got a a law firm demand letter now. I'm going to go fix my website or the mobile app, whatever it may be, the digital property. And then, you know, I'm now done. 
it never works that way. And if you just think about the velocity of marketing content that a company goes through, you know, think about an e-commerce site who uh, is constantly adding new inventory to the website. So you're never really one and done. You want to make sure that you embrace this. It's a journey. You have to educate customers that they go through. You know, yes, you came in because of a demand letter. We can help you solve that problem, but take care of the immediate pain point. But how do we help you continue to embrace accessibility into your organization? Because if everybody knows about it and everyone knows that this is a huge customer segment for us too, in addition to customer experience, the more they will be able to, to get on board with, you know what, we need to adopt this across the company. And in many cases, people don't realize it's within your company too. You may have employees with disabilities and people don't think about that. Yeah, no, exactly. It's interesting because this is a, it's almost like a latent pain type of sale that you have until it's not. And then it's a real pain, right? Because you're getting a demand letter from a, from a, from a law firm, someone trying to sue the mm-hmm. company. Uh, so it seems like the, the integration of, of marketing, how do we flip that on its head from being a latent pain type of situation to a, a, an opportunity, you know, to, to do different things more and in, in, in more interesting things and just respond to a demand letter becomes a really big opportunity for you in particular being marketing. So how are you working with a customer success team as it relates to that or, or the sales team or any other teams internally yeah. that have to sort of help make that pivot from responsive, reactive to proactive. Yeah, for sure. I think the first thing you need to do, and this is just my general advice to any company too, is you really have to know your audience. And part of it is really building out personas. And so as a company, when you look at the, the customer that is coming in from a demand letter, they're usually in the legal or the compliance space. It could be that they come in because they receive this demand letter and that's what they're focused on, right? And, but what you really have to look at is, is that really the customer that gets to a broader engagement? And so that's really when you partner with your customer success team, you partner with your sales team, and you really start to understand. And you have to ask them, you know, when you're, when you're in this process, legal and compliance only know about the legal and compliance aspect of it. But who owns the website? More often than not, it's mm-hmm. going to be marketing. You know, who actually does the work on the mobile app? More than likely a UX designer, you know, it's the product team. So really understanding who are all the players within your customer. And then at that point, you really start to, you want to apply the right type of messaging and how that resonates with them. It's going to vary. You know, I I joke about this a lot at our company, but we didn't really market to marketers before I joined. And uh, I came in and through the, I remember when I was chatting with Level Access, I said to our CEO and many of our team members, I said, you know, my CMO brethren out there, they don't really know much about accessibility. Uh, And if you're lucky enough to have a good design firm, because most CMOs, they go through a, a website redesign, et cetera, you will then be told by the good design firm and a responsible design firm that you should think about accessibility. But most of them don't know that. Right. So it's something where you really have to kind of know that audience. And so I go back to if you're talking to a marketer and you start to talk to them about demand letters and lawsuits, you, you have completely missed the mark there. Oh marketers like, you know what, you need to go talk to our legal person. Right. And same thing. Conversely, if you go to the legal and compliance person and you talk about why this is so great for diversity and inclusion initiatives and you talk about, you know, why this is so great for to approach a new customer segment, they're going to be like, why are you telling me this? So I think definitely it's the knowing your audience and you get to that data and that insight by being a great partner with your customer success and sales teams. Yeah, you're, uh, you're speaking to my heart here because I was, I was formerly at a um, digital marketing agency for a number of years. And so we did plenty of website redev- redesigns. We did plenty of, uh-huh. uh, you know, digital efforts. And I can tell you accessibility was definitely not on the top of our mind. So uh, finding out that you need to market to marketers and to, to build that uh, kind of capability within the organization certainly makes sense. Um, you know, as you came into the organization as well, and as you're thinking about the kind of marrying together um, marketing and customer success, mm-hmm. and even maybe even lobbying and in sales into there, um, how did you think about the kind of the technology that was at your fingertips to market to prospects, but then also marketing to maybe current customers um, and thinking about just the technology that was there, or maybe that you've experienced in your career and kind of getting, everybody on the same page. Cause like you mentioned, there's um, obviously you have prospects and then you can even go yeah. further and say within prospects, you've got, we'll say the legal department then you've got marketing department and you've probably got other, we'll say personas that you have to talk to. And then you carry that all the way through and they become a customer. And now you've, you've got them on the customer success side as well. Um, 
how do you think about marrying all of those messages together to make sure that the company is saying the right things at the right moment? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question, Jeff. And I, I think really it goes back to knowing your audience, you know, and knowing what point of the cycle and this customer journey that they're in. And that's why it's so important. It's so important to build out that customer journey. How do you see that happening for your customers? You know, they may come in because of a demand letter, very reactive, but as they progress, it's the, okay, I, I'm going to, how do you get more internal adoption? Um, have they thought about, right, some, some companies own multiple websites. How do you get the other websites of these bigger brands engaged? How do you get the HR team engaged? Because you could have, you know, a diversity inclusion impact in your program. And so uh, to answer your question about, you know, the sort of the technology aspect of it, the engagement with existing customers, spot on. You know, with, with marketing to customers, I will call it, you have to constantly keep them engaged. It is a process where particularly the bigger the company that you work with, the more people are involved in the project. And we are at a point right now where it's full employment. You know, so people are changing jobs. They do move up, get promoted. They, they come in and out of these teams. And for us, for accessibility, a lot of times it is a, you know, you have new team members being added because now they understand the importance. So they add more people to it. So what you have to do is customer success, not just look at the database of customers that you have right now and that you're working with. You have to constantly keep an eye out for how do I make sure that new people coming into the company help understand that too? And so some of the partner um, programs that we run on the marketing side, we could be like, yeah, hey, there's a, let's do a once a month webinar for all the new customer contacts coming in. You know, do they have any questions about accessibility? You do something just for them. And so you have to nurture them and, and market to them in a different way. But that nuance has to be very, very audience specific. If it's marketers, you want to speak to marketers. What can you do? Here's some accessibility tips for marketers. Um, if it is a person on the UX design team, you want to have stuff that's about continuous integration and continuous development, about design best practices. You know, or if it's someone uh, in the legal compliance department, you may want to talk more about legal trends and compliance trends and here's what's happening in your space. You know, your competitors are getting sued, so on and so forth. And so definitely keep it very audience specific, but definitely there has to be a, a very strong focus on that because all of your cross-sell and upsell opportunities, many of them, they come from those existing customers and you want to make sure that they understand and you continue to market to them. The other thing that you touched on a little bit there as well uh, that we've thought maybe long about is um, the kind of operational side of things. So, you know, we've talked a lot recently um, with a number of our prospects and just in our own kind of messaging about customer success operations and, and really looking at how um, sales ops and marketing ops have kind of evolved over time um, where yeah. they, you know, are an important part of the, the organization. You know, they're there to really help drive the performance of the marketing initiatives and really help drive the performance of the sales team. And now you're starting to see that on customer success. I'm curious um, if you've seen a similar evolution, you know, in your career in terms of <laughs> operationalization of, um, of some of these functions. And if, and if you see, have seen that in your career and if you, um, you know, see anything currently at level access that's very similar. Yeah, for sure, Jeff. You know, it's uh, without having to uh, age myself here. I've, I've been around the tech space for a while, and I did a stint, a two-year stint as an industry analyst, looking at marketing and sales technology before I joined Level Access. So your question speaks straight to my heart. Um, I'll give you one example. If you look at a marketer job description from, let's just say, ten years ago. And you look at what those roles and responsibilities include, and then you look at a marketer job description today. I can share with you the ones today, they definitely include, you know, knowledge of marketing automation. It's going to include data. If you don't see data in that job description, there's something really wrong <laughs> with, that, uh, with that marketer job description. Um, marketing and sales have become more technology oriented uh, than, than any other function. And I'll give you one other example. You, you think about the term sales enablement today. And sales enablement is a hot topic. A lot of companies are talking about, you know, building a sales enablement team. But I can share with you, you know, I was you know, very fortunate to be one of the first 16 people to work with uh, Scott Tintucci, who was a former Forrester analyst, and he was at Alexander Group, where that wasn't the moniker. It wasn't sales enablement. And we're only talking about, what, four years ago? And, the, you know, a group of us, 16 of us got together in my office here in Tyson's at my old company, and we sat together and we said, 
you know, it, it is this marketing and sales partnership. It's a little bit of sales ops. It's a little bit of coaching and mentoring and sales training. It's all of these things, but it really helps enable sales teams and sales people. And so we called ourselves the Sales Enablement Society. And now the Sales Enablement Society has gone from 16 people in a conference room in D.C. to now it is, I think, that we have 7,000 members on LinkedIn now. So it is something where now I'm so proud when I see companies like major Fortune 500 brands, they are hiring people with a sales enablement in their title. It is, it is pretty incredible. So that's the kind of shift that we've now seen. So when you talk about sales ops, marketing ops, and absolutely, I think you're spot on, we're going to see more and more customer success ops. And there, it's going to be a team of people super and hyper-focused on data. It's looking at the metrics and KPIs. It's looking at engagement rates, right? Our customers engaging with us. And, when, and there's going to be a machine learning and AI component to that, where when you see engagement scores fall, that may sound a red alert to the customer success manager to say, hey, red alert, you know, this customer used to log in five times a day and now they barely log in once every two weeks. You know, there's a problem here and you need to go investigate it. So I think that that's really where the, the emergence of these ops teams that come in, it's really, really exciting. No doubt. We, we've been just, that's been one of the hottest topics of conversation in our, in our travels over the past really six to 12 months. And, it's, it's super exciting. So the interesting thing is you still have sales ops. You still have some semblance of marketing ops. Those two yep. are sort of merging together and, you know, with more ABM strategies, even going outside of just enterprise sales right. and marketing. Um, and <clears throat> so we're, we're trying to think about how to, how to overlay CS ops as a really close cousin to those things, because I think all of these teams have a tendency to build out operations groups within their silos but part of the value of this is having end-to-end visibility on what's working from a marketing perspective all the way back through, you know, the customer delivery and renewal cycle mm-hmm. back, you know, in, into the referral and advocacy cycle back up to the front of the funnel. So how are you structuring that? Or are you seeing similar, um, similar structures there with regard to sales enablement and operations and these other operations groups sort of working together really closely? Or uh, just curious if you've seen anything that resembles that. Yeah, for sure. And Jay, I think that's the evolution of these roles, you know, and if you think about how it's evolved to why is it a separate sales ops team and a separate marketing ops team, it's primarily technology driven. You know, it's the marketing team using marketing automation, you know, your Eloqua, Marketos, Pardots of the world, that type of solution. And then there's analytics and there's reporting in there. And so marketers go in and they get their reporting from there. And so that becomes a very much a marketing ops role, right? Because you're doing a lot of the operations due to the technology. Same thing on the sales side. You're working on CRM solutions. It could be configure price quote. It could be sales comp solution. And so therefore you become like a sales ops, you know. But I've also kind of seen the, um, the ops team sit in finance. So for us at Level Access in particular, sales ops sits with our finance team and works very closely with our head of sales, works very closely with me, uh, because they, they do a lot of the financial KPI reporting. So that, I've seen that type of model as well. But you're spot on. I think that's the evolution of that role is that, you know, does it make sense to have a separate marketing ops team and a separate you know, a customer success ops team. I think if you're a huge company and you're running, you know, maybe 20 different technologies and your tech stack for each of these functions, then I would say, yeah, it probably makes a lot of sense to do that. But you still want to make sure that there is accountability on each side. Because otherwise, I've also seen, again, this is without naming names, when I was at a, a research firm and I've seen, you know, clients do this, is that they, they each run their own tech stack and report and then nothing matches. <laughs> kind oh, of yeah. Go, you, you, uh, yeah. Your version of the truth, right? <laughs> it might, right. It's not me that's the problem. It's marketing. It's not sales. Right. Customer success. But right. so exactly. I, I love the idea of that operations group being housed in, in finance. Actually, one of the companies I'm working with right now, it's we have a VP of operations, SVP of operations, and all the operational things are run out of that team. And it's the, the, the thing I like most about it is that they can be very objective about yeah what the answers that they're seeing are and how the data fits together. And they can sort of uh, call it like they see it without having some of the, the politics involved, which is right. helpful. And, and I'd say even at the end of the day, if you have a large organization that, because at some point you're going to be able to scale, right? If I have a 200 person services team or a, you know, a 200 person sales team, I'm going to have some embedded operations functions, but there still has to be that tie up above where all the data in the business is, is being leveraged 
together so that we have one cohesive version of the story. Instead of multiple. And don't measure metrics for the sake of measuring metrics. Pick the ones that matter. And that really is sitting down together with sales, with customer success, with marketing and say, what are the KPIs that matter in these particular stages of the sales cycle? You know, so don't measure things just for, you know, they call them vanity metrics, right? It's more of the measure the things that matter and then build your ops plan around that. So, and it's consistent. So it's easier said than done. That's the thing. It's, it's yeah. the, when you put it in practice, every company is dealing with legacy data. You're dealing with, you know, bad reporting from the past. And now you're kind of down this rabbit hole and you have to kind of stick with it for a while before you can make changes. And so I, by, by no means, I try to make this sound easy. And a lot of times people are just dealing with technology that has a lot of junk data in there. So it is a process and a journey. But I do think that if you take that with the purpose and the intention in mind of, I want us to get to a, a process where, you know, we all agree upon what are we measuring on. I think that's the, that's the key. Yeah, we, we've seen the operations role really split into two kind of personas who, who fill it. One is more of the systems and data analyst or strategist role. And then mm-hmm. the other is the, the, the person or the role who runs the strategic initiatives that cross all the data. So somebody who right. can be, again, like objective, but also who can, who can run almost like a program manager independently of all those things and, and help prioritize the, the biggest problems and then drive an initiative that actually goes out and solves it because behind bad data are bad processes are, you know, misaligned goals are you know, all right. these other you know, things. And unless you get to the root cause of what those things are, it's hard to, um, it's hard to really solve for them the right way. Yeah, for sure. I agree. How do you, awesome. I'm curious um, as you start thinking, you know, more about the kind of evolution that we've been talking about around all the operations and everything. Um, have you seen a similar shift? Um, and I'm, I guess I'm, I'm teeing up this question because I feel like you're like, I already, already know the answer. So I'm going to be shocked <laughs> that the answer is, is different. But um, what is the shift maybe that you've seen over your career in the ways that we engage customers or customers engage with us and, and how you've had to kind of adapt or change the, the way that you're marketing to customers, whether they're current mm-hmm. or prospects? kind of where they are, how they're engaging, you know, whether it's video, is it actual content? Is it, yep. you know, um, advertising? Like, what does that really look like? So how's that maybe shifted? And, and how do you think about that today, especially given the, I guess, the current customer landscape and how they're probably demanding a lot more of us than, than at any other point in time, you know, when they think about the software and making that purchase. Um, so I'm curious where you've seen that shift happen as well. Yeah, for sure. It, I, I think that there has been no time in our history that has been more transformative in how uh, people buy, how they consume content, than really the shifts in over the last, you know, call it the last 12 years, even with the advent of social media and more. I mean, a lot of times we tend to forget, you know, when you think about the histories of companies like LinkedIn and Facebook, et cetera, they're only like 12 to 15 year old companies. These are, these are not uh, you know, sort of, you know, long 50 year companies and they've only been around for, for a little over a decade. So, and you think about how much they've changed, how customers interact. The other thing is the content consumption. I remember back when I first started as a marketer, and this is again, I want to go date myself here, but it was, you know, it's, I worked for a fortune 500 company and marketing was, uh, you know, very much ad based. It was go put a ad out in a particular magazine, uh, the Wall Street Journal, you know, ads, not to say that those don't matter anymore. They still have their place, I think, in some cases, but it was very much that type of advertising, right? I was in the B2C world. uh, And so it was a lot of, you know, a lot of these contests and different types of things. I call this number, call this 800 number and the number of caller, you know, X number of callers gets blah, blah, blah. So it was that that type of uh, marketing. And then compare it to where we're at now. The customer engagement can come from, you know, online from a video, just like you mentioned, Jeff. So, but your videos can't be too long. You know, people don't have the patience for it. Uh, You know, you have to keep it two minutes or less. And so that is the optimum level of engagement. You think about digital ads. Are you doing retargeting? Everybody finds retargeting ads kind of annoying, but if they're done well, they're done right, they could be very, very effective because these are people that have already visited your website. So there are many, many strategies now where I think for the customer today, there's just a a lot of noise and you have to break through the noise if you want your content, your message, et cetera, to resonate. And so what I've also found is that you have to keep it short and you have to keep it fast. You know, there was a stat I shared with my team 
and I use a lot when I was an industry analyst, but the amount of time that someone on their mobile device to wait for a page to load is three seconds. If that page doesn't load in three seconds, they're moving on. And so think about, you know, you and I and our lives and how we use our mobile devices. And I tell you, that's pretty spot on, right? If you try to hit a website on your mobile device and it's not loading, like you're moving on. And so it's a very similar thing. People, people are just a lot more impatient. There's also a lot more content out there. It's a lot more stuff for them to sort through. And so I think that these, you know, digital algorithms will just get better and better at, at doing that and breaking through the noise. But for your existing customers, you have to keep that in mind as well. You know, how do you, how do you give them relevant content that makes sense, that resonates, that's educational? And one of the things that I'm super proud of for, uh, for Level Access, and, you know, this, this happens because our CEO and founder is a rock star in this space. Um, we really produce content like our webinars, et cetera, not with the lens of like, oh, I want to get some more leads. No, it's, it, we truly want it to be educational. And that's why some of the top, you know, Ivy League universities in the world, um, I don't think I can name them here, but they put our, web, our webinar schedule on their university site and they offer continuing education credits for people who attend our webinars. That's amazing. That wasn't like a marketing thing that we did. That's just because the, the university thought our content was so great. So you have to kind of really constantly stay ahead of that and don't rest on your laurels, right? Something that may work today may not work for you a year from now. So you've got to stay on the forefront of technology and what's happening and how people consume content. Yeah, that's, that's incredible about the, that story about the, the universities. And that's, at the end of the day, that's the, that has to have the intention behind it too. I think more than anything, the consumer these days has become a lot more skeptical because they've seen every trick in the book, theoretically. Right. You know, there's a lot more out there, like you said, that they've seen in terms of the noise. And so they understand when you're actually authentic and when it's true. But I also think the other part you mentioned that was really interesting is just around the, the actual educational aspect. I, I would think that, you know, with level access and who you guys are engaging with in terms of brands, there is a lot of value from a brand perspective to say, hey, we have an accessible website. You know, we're speaking to uh, like you said, a, a mission that we have as an organization that we've you know gone and made these steps. So I think um, right. that's also an interesting aspect. And I wonder if you, from a customer success perspective, come across that where you know your kind of customer success team is actually thinking about how uh, that organization can uh, you know leverage the fact that they are an accessible website and that means something in today's society. And whether that's a you know a question or a prompt that's come down from customers before, if you don't really see that much. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, you know, you're spot on with that too, Jeff. It, it is, we are now at a point in time in our culture where the diversity and inclusion message really resonates. And in particular for a lot of companies where they see that as a competitive advantage. You know, what a lot of companies don't realize is that for many industries, you have to be accessible to be able to sell into that space. So talk about, you know, state and local government, right, federal, um, you have to be 508, Section 508 compliant. Um, if you're in the airline industry, you have to adhere to the Airline Carrier Access Act. There are many, many regulations where you have to be compliant in, um, in those cases. But for, for our customers in particular, and kind of what we, we think about is that uh, we want to make sure that we are helping them amplify the goodness that they do in the space. And so one example I'll give you is uh, we actually have a video on our website right now. It's just a very short clip of one of our customers from a major healthcare company just talking about how much they care about their members. And their members mean a lot of people who are people with disabilities. Think about the injured. You may have a temporary disability. You know, you may go skiing, break your arm, and, you know, you, you are now, you, you got to use your voice command on your phone and on the website, right? So people don't think about that. That is a form of disability for a temporary time being. Uh, so, so one of those, you know, kind of situations is um, we want to help our customers amplify that and talk about that because you're right, it's a competitive advantage. They may need it to sell more. They may need it to, may need it to reach more customers. Or three, uh, the third one, which isn't talked about as much, is actually about attracting top talent. We talked earlier about we are at near a, a full employment economy, you know, and so a yeah. lot of times people don't realize if your applicant tracking system and your HR system is not accessible, you are actually preventing great candidates from applying for jobs. Um, or, you know, there's now a couple of cases where employees are suing their employer. There's two very kind of prominent cases going on right now 
where, uh, you know, it's the, someone said, Hey, I, I can't, I can't get promoted because the internal system where we do performance reviews. And so if I had a team, I couldn't really put in their performance reviews because I'm disabled. You know, those kinds of cases are now circulating through. And guess what? If you're out there as a brand and you're touting about how great you are at diversity and inclusion, and meanwhile, you get a lawsuit because your internal website isn't accessible. I mean, that's a huge black eye. And so Definitely. We want to help our customers promote the good work that they do. We have a page on our website. We call our customers vanguards of inclusion because that's who they are. They believe in this and they embrace it and we're there to help them with that. That's awesome. The relationship between marketing and customer success, I feel like is, is something that is coming full circle. It probably should have always been there and should have always been, should always be really, really strong. But I think there's new aspects of it, particularly on the content side of things that you, that you talked about earlier that, are, um, are really interesting and compelling that, that can actually help a brand grow overall, you know, and not, not just retain and, and sell to existing customers, but those success stories can actually permeate back and, and help us really uh, drive top line growth with new logos too. Um, I mean, after all, customers are where we get success stories from, in my mind. So. 100%. Hundred percent, and I'll I'll leave your audience with this one tip. And we recently did this, and I thought it just worked out really, really well so far. Is um, you know have a marketing toolkit ready to go when you sign a new customer. It's like, hey, here's a welcome kit. You know, it's got some recent news articles. It, we we did this whole thing where uh, we have a deck now where if you want to get more internal buy-in from your other stakeholders, because accessibility is one of those things that could live in multiple departments. And so you want to make sure that you give and are your, uh, your main points of contact at the customer site. Like, hey, here's some things that you can use to talk about your program, you know, and help you gain internal buy-in and support and budget, you know, do those things. And we give them a, a sample press release template, you know, it's like, hey, if you want to promote your great work in this area, here's a template ready to go, you know, introduce us to your marketing team. We can get them engaged because the other main thing is I'll say, and then this is a quote that I saw, and I will find out who to attribute it to and send it to you afterwards. But um, there was a person who said, you know, every customer just wants to feel like they're the hero. And so make them mm-hmm. feel like they're the hero. And they're making change and they're making progress. Is it, and they're being that, 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 you know, sort of person who helps move their organization forward. So just remember, keep your customer the hero. That's awesome. That is a, a good nugget to end on. Thank you so much for your time. We look forward to staying in touch and following your journey and applying some of what you've <laughs> told us here probably to our own business as well. So uh, we'll talk to you soon, Cindy. Thank you. Great. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Thanks so much, Jay. Thanks so much, Jeff. Appreciate it. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to the Gain, Grow, Retain podcast. If you liked what you heard, please take a moment and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues and subscribe. We really appreciate it. Talk to you soon.